Perhaps the most interesting aspect of chemical kinetics is the study of catalysis. Catalysis is uh, getting a reaction to go faster by putting something else in the pot, but the thing that you've added is unchanged by the overall reaction. So let's now look at a sort of generalized picture of what a catalyst does. Here's a reaction coordinate diagram. We have reactants and we have products. And reactants go to products, but they have a large activation energy. Remember, activation energy is the amount of energy you have to put in to the reaction to get to the transition, st transition state or activated complex, the thing that is at the peak of this um, reaction coordinate diagram, so that the highest energy. And then once you get to there, the reaction slides on down to products. And this is an exothermic reaction, as indicated by the fact that reactants are higher in energy than products. And if you think about this as just a hill that you have to climb over, it takes a long time to get over the top of a hill. The reaction is slow. But if you could imagine putting a tunnel through the middle of the hill, and it doesn't even have to have a little bump in it. Suppose it's just a straight tunnel. Um, where I'm from in Colorado, there's the Eisenhower Tunnel, which goes right through a mountain. Saves you a lot of time because you don't have to go over the top of the mountain. You just go right through the mountain. And the point is that you could get through the mountain a lot faster. And the reason why you can get through the mountain faster is because the activation energy is lower. So you've created a pathway at lower activation energy, and in doing so, you make the reaction go more quickly. So it doesn't affect the driving force at all. The driving force for the reaction, or the exothermicity of the reaction, is exactly the same. It's that you make the reaction go faster by providing a lower energy pathway to get from reactants to products. Okay, so let's look at an example. And the first example I'd like to look at is the reaction of hydrogen peroxide to form water and oxygen. This is an example of a disproportionation reaction because the oxidation state of oxygen over here is minus 1, and it's going to minus 2 and 0. And this reaction is very slow in the absence of a catalyst. How do we know this? Well, if you take a bottle of hydrogen peroxide, such as you might buy at the store, um, you can leave it on your shelf for a while, and when you need it, you can go and get it, and it's still mostly hydrogen peroxide. But if you ever look at the side of the bottle, it tells you when you should not use it anymore. And it's not that you shouldn't use it anymore, it's that it's basically decomposed to water and O2, so it's just not good for anything anymore. So this is a slow reaction in the absence of catalysis, <coughs> but we can make it go faster, and the way we can make it go faster is to throw in some iodide anion, I minus. And now, instead of this reaction going in maybe a um, bimolecular reaction where two hydrogen peroxides have to crash into each other, there's an entirely different pathway that involves I minus to form water and, um, and hypoiodite. And then the hydrogen peroxide reacts with hypoiodite to form water and O2 and I minus. Now notice, when we add up the two steps, so these are elementary reactions, and we add them up, and I minus does not appear in the balanced reaction. So that's one property of a catalyst. We already said that it works by decreasing the activation energy, and the second is that it doesn't appear in the balanced reaction. The third thing is that it could appear in the rate law. <coughs> so if we write down what the rate expression should be for this reaction, the slow step is the first step, so the rate is going to look like K1 times the hydrogen peroxide concentration times the I minus concentration. So the catalyst appears in the rate law, meaning that if you add more catalyst, the reaction goes faster. That's not an unreasonable idea. But ultimately, the catalyst ends up unchanged by the overall reaction. So in other words, we put in I minus and I minus comes back out the other side, and so the catalyst is unchanged by the overall reaction. So those are four properties, that catalysts operate by decreasing the activation energy, that catalyst is not part of the balanced reaction, the catalyst can appear in the rate expression, and that the catalyst is unchanged by the reaction. All right, so now this is an example of homogeneous catalysis, which means that the catalyst and the reactants are in the same phase. In this case, I should have written it, but this is an aqueous reaction. So this is aqueous hydrogen peroxide going to water and O2 when the O2 comes bubbling off, but this reaction occurs in aqueous solution. And now let's look at a different case, not homogeneous catalysis, but heterogeneous catalysis, which is you have the catalyst that's in one phase and the reactants in another phase, and that reaction is the catalyst of uh, the catalytic decomposition of hydrogen peroxide to form water in O2, but catalyzed by manganese dioxide, MnO2, manganese 4 oxide. And it turns out that that reaction has been used as a, as a um, 
special effect for a well-known television show, I Dream of Jeannie, that was probably in the late 60s, uh, and it starred Barbara Eden and uh, Larry Hagman. And that, that demonstration is very um, dramatic, and it looks like this. So this is a genie bottle, so there's a genie inside the bottle, and if I want the genie to come out, I say, hey genie, come out, and I pull the stopper out, and out comes genie. Oh. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, well, guess what? It was just a television trick. You don't really get a beautiful woman uh, with a bare midriff standing around when you do things like that. Okay, so, now that's an example of heterogeneous catalysis. So the manganese dioxide was a solid, and it went in there, and if we now filtered this solution, we'd find the manganese dioxide is still in there, and it's unchanged by the overall reaction. The reaction was the hydrogen peroxide going to water in O2. Now, let me move this out of the way. The bottle's hot because it's an exothermic reaction. Um, and I want to talk about another heterogeneous catalytic application, and that is catalytic converters. Catalytic converters are in your car, um, and what they do is they treat the exhaust that's coming out of your car. So this is a catalytic converter that we've cut a big chunk out of, so they don't normally have a big hole in them. Um, and you might not be able to see this, but there's sort of a honeycomb network of sort of uh, cream-colored stuff here, and the gases, the hot gases, go past that honeycomb, and chemical reactions occur, and they occur on metals that are coating that honeycomb. And the kinds of reactions that we're worried about are carbon monoxide and various unburned hydrocarbons reacting with oxygen to go to carbon dioxide and water. So that's one, carbon monoxide is bad for you. Um, it can kill you in principle. Uh, and unburned hydrocarbons are responsible for smog. So you really want to get rid of these things. You're going to turn them into carbon dioxide and water where carbon dioxide is uh, more innocuous. It turns out it's still a greenhouse gas, but if we're going to drive cars, we're going to have that problem. And water, which is, of course, entirely innocuous. And then the other thing is we have these oxides of nitrogen, and these are responsible for acid rain. So nitrogen, uh, nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide ultimately get oxidized up to nitric acid, and that's acid rain. And we can get rid of these things, turn them back into, or if we could get rid of these things, by turning them back into N2 and O2, that would be a really good thing. These, by the way, arise not by design, but just because there is nitrogen inside the combustion chamber in your car, and so you sort of inadvertently make these oxides of nitrogen, and then these go on. Uh, and if you can catalytically turn them back into N2 and O2, these are downhill reactions, these are downhill reactions. So in other words, there's a driving force for this to occur, they're all exothermic reactions, but if you don't have something on which to uh, catalyze, to essentially expedite the reactions, incidentally, the Chinese word for catalyst is the same word as for matchmaker. Basically, what we're doing is we've got something that's taking the pieces of the reaction and putting them together to get them to go to products. Matchmaker takes a, a guy and a girl and gets them together and introduces them and hope they hit it off. And whether or not there's a driving force for them to get married or whatever, that's totally separate. The point is the matchmaker comes in, gets them together, but then the matchmaker goes away. So the matchmaker is unchanged by the overall reaction. So it's, it's a pretty good analogy. Anyway, it turns out that the kinds of catalysts in a catalytic converter are things like platinum and palladium. And since it's heter it's a uh, heterogeneous catalysis, it only hurt, occurs on the surface of the catalyst. So you have the surface and the gas molecules come in and they hit the surface and they go away. And so if you have this great big block of platinum, you're wasting a whole lot of platinum. What you want to do is make a thin layer of platinum because it's only the platinum atoms on the surface that do anything. And you don't want to put, you know, $100,000 worth of platinum into every car on its catalytic converter. And so what they do is they make these uh, alumina substrates on which they coat a thin layer of platinum or palladium or whatever other transition metals or metal oxides that they want. And then as the gases go by, they'll hit these catalysts and these reactions will occur. And so your, your fuel is going to be cleaner. Now, um, when I was a kid, they put tetraethyl lead in the gasoline, and they don't do that anymore. And the problem was that tetraethyl lead poisons the catalytic converter, so it kills its activity, and so that's bad. And so now we all use unleaded gasoline. That's why people talk about unleaded. The reason is we used to put lead. Lead is, you know, it's a toxin. It kills you. But we used to, for reasons that are not entirely clear, it's not clear that it was a wise decision, but we used to use lead um, as an octane enhancer. So that's an example of, of a heterogeneous ca catalyst, a second example. And now, the final thing I want to talk about in catalysis is nature's catalysts. And I uh, hinted at this before. Nature's catalysts are called enzymes. And enzymes um, catalyze chemical reactions. You may have seen, for instance, uh, in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, when Sean Connery has been shot and he's bleeding, 
and um, Harrison Ford comes out with the Holy Grail, and it's, it's a cup, and he pours it onto Sean Connery's bullet wound, and the bullet wound sort of fizzes and foams. That was a solution of hydrogen peroxide, like what we played around with here just a second ago, and your blood has an enzyme that catalyzes the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, just like the manganese dioxide, or just like the iodide, that enzyme is called catalase. It ends in ASE, and that's how you can tell if a biological agent is a catalyst, is because it ends in ASE. Some other catalysts that are familiar, um, you have in your mouth something called amylase, which breaks apart sugars. And so, if you, two things. One, you can put a bunch of crackers in your mouth and chew them on them for a while and just sort of hold them there, and things will tar start to take really sweet, because the amylase breaks down the starch into sugars, and those sugars taste sweet. That's one application. A second application is if you have a sort of a starchy, thick soup, like Boston clam chowder. And if it's a little too thick, you can thin it out by spitting into it. And the spit has amylase, and it'll break down some of the starches and thin out your soup. Kind of disgusting, but that's an application. Um, toilet cleaner, not, not the stuff that, I mean, not toilet cleaner, drain cleaner. Not the stuff that cleans out a clog, but sort of the buildup remover has enzymes in it. It has proteases that break up proteins and amylases that break up sugars, uh, break up carbohydrates, starches, and by dissolving these things, by catalytically breaking them up, we can get them to dissolve and so we can clear out the drain. So that's another application. And then the last one I'm going to talk about is that a lot of Asians, like myself, um, lack an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. And what alcohol dehydrogenase does is it processes the ethanol that you drink in a drink. And so a lot of, of Asians, when they take a drink, like my little brother, can drink half a bottle of beer and he's drunk. He's wasted. And it's because that alcohol just continues to course through his body because he doesn't have the necessary enzyme to um, break down the ethanol, and so he stays drunk on a really small amount of ethanol. And uh, people who lack this enzyme typically get very flushed almost as soon as they drink alcohol. Uh, one, more, one more enzyme is that a lot of people, again, Asians like myself, lack lactase. Lactase is the enzyme that allows you to break down lactose, which is the sugar in milk, and if you lack lactase, you, don't, you can't process that sugar, the milk sugar, a lot of older people actually don't have it as well. Um, babies have a lot of it because obviously what they do is they, they live on milk. But anyway, um, if you don't have that, then the lactose makes it all the way down into your lower gut where there are bacteria that chew on it and it gives you indigestion and it gives you some other unmentionable um, digestive uh, uh, maladies anyway. So the point is that Nature has catalysts as well. Catalysts make reactions that are slow, go faster, and we've learned how to use catalysis in things like catalytic converters to clean up our atmosphere, and Hollywood uses catalysis to do some interesting special effects.